to this is your life. Many of us are used to risking our life and limb in the love of outdoor pursuits. Boats catch fire. Hang gliders crash. Bushwalkers fall over cliffs. Swimmers are pulled out of the sea and fishermen are swept off the rocks. Today the scales are tipped in favour of our survival by people like our guest of honour tonight, a daring young doctor who arrives in a helicopter when disaster strikes and whose skill and courage have saved many Australians from pain, paralysis and even sometimes certain death. That doctor is surprising in many ways as you will see. Right now, our guest of honour is arriving, as usual, at the Royal North Shore Hospital's helipad. So, uh, let's go. Dr. Sue, you've actually saved hundreds of lives and you seek no recognition, and many of those you save are unconscious and they get no chance to thank you. Dr. Alley, I've been wanting to meet you. Famous shark fisherman, Peter Bruce. <laughs> Peter. You went out shark fishing on October the 9th, 1977, when the unexpected happened. Now, will you tell us about it? Yes, Roger, I was uh, shark fishing about nine kilometres off uh, Marley Beach with a friend, and um, we'd had three or so sharks tied up beside the boat. And uh, I'd been fighting another shark for approximately two and a half to three hours. And um, another small boat had came round uh, with his father and two sons in it to watch the big shark jumping out of the water and he cut my line off so I was standing up there swearing and cursing and telling him what I thought of him and uh, the friend that was with me says don't worry about it he said get the one that's behind the boat so I uh, looked down behind the boat and there was a, a big tiger shark I don't know how big but very big and um, next thing I had severe chest pains and uh, I collapsed on the floor of the boat and I was unconscious. You had a heart attack? Yes, Roger. A heart attack in shark-infested waters? That story and other adventures in the life of Dr. Sue Rowley in just a moment. <laughs> Peter, the rescue helicopter located your boat, Trangy, off Marley Beach. Sue, I said we'll have to jump, and you said you've got to be joking. Veteran crewman with the rescue helicopter, Rick Maley. <laughs> now, Rick, as the helicopter hovered over the boat, uh, surrounded by sharks, it was necessary for Sue to get into the boat. What happened? Well, I jumped first and uh, had a look at the patient and decided that I couldn't manage the patient. I looked up at Sue inside the helicopter and I beckoned her down. With one look at my face and the <laughs> shark circling the boat, she said, no way. I said, you're coming down, I can't handle it. And with that, Sue got out of the floats, jumped into my arms, <clears throat> which I <laughs> folded up completely and fell onto the deck. We had a good look at the patient and uh, we decided that we'd have to transport him underneath the helicopter to the beach. So. 
Dangling 30 feet below the helicopter, you hold the unconscious man between you for the long ride into the shore. And once on the beach, Sue, you're able to stabilize his condition before he is flown to hospital. Now, Peter Bruce, we're certainly very glad that you are alive and well to help us tell Sue's story tonight. And also, thank you very much, Richard Maley, for being with us. So it all began when you're born on May the 22nd, 1950, in a suburb of Birmingham. Let's get out the family slides. You grew up to be quite a tomboy, Sue, playing cricket and football with your brother John. You go to Hall Green Primary School, where we see you at the age of six. Summer vacations are spent at the beach. Here we see you at Bournemouth at the age of seven, and also at Mallorca a year later. In the wintertime, you and your brother romp in the snow and build snowmen. And here we see you at the age of 12, jumping your horse, Dram Bowie, a gift from your father. Well, Sue, at the age of 11, you go to Swanhurst Grammar School. And as you grow up, you feel the travel bug and you begin to save money, working as a petrol pump attendant, a barmaid, even a store detective in your dad's supermarket. But you were such a frail baby. We've flown her from Birmingham, England, your mother, Gladys Rowley. Gladys, will you tell us about the young Sue Rowley? Yes, we worried about her a lot, <laughs> but she was all right. She turned out to be quite a tomboy. <laughs> she had a rabbit and a horse. She didn't like her doll she had. <laughs> she was a bit of a leader, I gather, too. She was at school. She was a bit of a troubleshooter. And she, she was always backing other people's causes. And she wanted to be a doctor. And she's always loved people. I think she loves people more than anything. I think also, Gladys, you've got a, a message from the family, haven't you? Yes. Your dad wanted to be here behind me, but he sent his love. And John, so do always <laughs> do, do that. Always mix us up, yes. <laughs> well, Gladys, after coming all the way from Birmingham, would you like to sit next to Sue? Mm. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Sue, you study at uh, St. Mary's Medical School at the University of London. School means hard work, of course, always, but uh, we also believe that at school you had a bit of fun there as well. Sue, we can't go on meeting like this. Fellow student at St. Mary's, and now ship's doctor with <laughs> Piano Sea Princess, that's right, Dr. Andrew Iddles. <laughs> Andrew, you were at medical school together. Now, tell us about <laughs> Sue Rowley, medical student, will you? That's right, Roger. Well, uh, Sue has always been a fun person, and uh, as a student, uh, she had a lot of fun. Do you remember the Lita Club that uh, you organised for me with students? Um, it's a Bacchanalian society of a dozen of us that ate well once a fortnight. Remember your one of your 21st birthdays, which we had on the lawn of Wilson House? <laughs> Magnums of champagne and steak. Those were the days. <laughs> After we both qualified, we went our separate ways, bumped into each other now and again in various hospitals. Another memory is the time you were my patient <laughs> in Canberra, when I admitted you late one night to the ship's hospital, let you sleep it off before going to work the next morning. <laughs> Well, Dr. Riddles, at that point, we'll stop, right? Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. So you take your first big trip without your parents in your first year's vacation in the first car you own, an old Mini. You and a girlfriend take a tent and drive through Russia to the Arctic Circle and back through Scandinavia. You get into trouble and are rescued by a young man. On film from the USA, professor of languages at Northwest University, Chicago, Henry Cooper. I remember the first time we met, it was in the Soviet Union when a group, a group of us American tourists was driving through and we came upon these two girls who were standing very distraught by their smashed up Morris Mini. You came running over to us and you said, uh, my God, a lorry just flipped up that stone and smashed our windscreen. 
We didn't really know what you were talking about, but by the time we figured it out and helped you get your windshield fixed, we became good friends, and I think we've stayed that way ever since. Anytime you need a new windscreen for your helicopter, let me know. You've always got a friend who'll help you get one. So in 1973, you graduate from medical school and your mother and father are at Albert Hall to see you receive your degree from the Queen Mother. You begin to see what emergency medicine's all about in the casualty unit at St Mary's Hospital, riding in an ambulance through the streets of London. Three years and 10,000 miles later, you are flying to your emergencies. Hello, Dr Sue. Remember Maruba Beach? 17-year-old Karen Harris. <laughs> Karen, will you tell us your story? Well, I was swimming at Moobra Beach when I was hit by a surfboard. Anyway, I stood up to get help and I collapsed in the water. Anyway, a friend of mine lifted me out of the water. He thought I was drowning and carried me to the sand. And I was just lying there, thought I was going to be paralysed for the rest of my life. Anyway, Dr Sue was, came to my help and she assured me that everything could be all right. And it was, and here I am tonight. Well, Sue, because you got to Karen at the crucial moment, she can walk today. Few people realise that in the first hour of an emergency, it is touch and go for 50% of the cases. That's why you specialised in emergency medicine. So this year you become an Australian citizen, but uh, let's go back to your arrival here. In 1976, you decide to take a holiday in Australia and become an emergency case yourself. You fall at Singapore Airport, and by the time you get to Sydney Airport, you have to go straight to hospital for surgery on an injured knee. Your holiday funds run out, and so you begin to work at the Royal North Shore Hospital. Weekends, you work in the casualty unit at Mona Vale Hospital, carrying on your specialisation in emergency medicine and resuscitation. And you see the life-saving association's rescue helicopter at work. So you said you ought to have a doctor flying with you. And we said, when we find the right guy, we will. Director of the Wales Helicopter Emergency Rescue Service, Ian Badham. Ian, while the PR officer of the Surf Life Saving Association in 1973, you talked the association into finding a sponsor for a rescue medical helicopter. But how did Sue Rowley get involved with the service? Well, as we were called to more and more medical cases, we realised that we perhaps needed a doctor. And as we flew cases into Mount Vale Hospital, none other than Sue said, well, you know, I should go out on these cases. I should be at your standby base. And it was... In December 1976, that the service was called to Palm Beach, where a young man had a spear uh, embedded in his stomach, and you were the doctor the crew picked up and took out to that location. So the way you handled that, the discussions we had afterwards, we said, all right then, let's have Sue Riley do duty for 12 months and see how it goes from there, and it's been a long 12 months. <laughs> Ian, there was one uh, very difficult rescue that uh, you and Sue were involved in. Will you tell us about that? Yes, it was in October 1977. The police called us to Kelly's Falls near Wollongong with a report that a young boy had fallen down a cliff about 50 metres. And there was very thick fog and very tall timbers and at first the helicopter couldn't get in. We landed nearby and the police drove Sue and myself to the site. And then it was a matter of getting some overalls from the Bush Fire Brigade to put on Sue to convince her that she could indeed climb down the side of this fairly steep ravine to get to the critically injured patient at the bottom. And uh, Sue, when you, we did manage to coax you and get you down there somehow, the work you did on the patient uh, with the ambulance men made a lot of difference. After he was lifted out, it was then a matter of trying to get you back up the side. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, well, the police rescue squad did it with a rope. They even gave you a whistle, as I remember, to That's blow right. in case you got uh, right. stuck halfway. But you, you made it up, and I think you even recovered eventually from it all. <laughs> well, here you are, Sue, at uh, the end of your rope. And here now is the young fellow you last oh. saw unconscious at the bottom of that ravine, Mark Kirsch from Engadine. <laughs> OK, Mark, what would you like to say? I don't remember much at all about the accident. Uh, I have been told a lot about it, and I heard you were fantastic, and I really want to thank you. I can't thank you enough. Mark, thank you for being here. What does it say something, Sue, please? Yes, I do, actually. Uh, I have to say, sometime this evening, that I'm just purely 
uh, a part of a team and that I can't function without my team and without Ian and without my rescue crewmen and without my doctors and without my support, I am nothing. And I, at, at the most, an opportunist. I've just found the most beautiful bunch of guys and uh, have just managed to slot in there and be able to help a little bit. And uh, I would like to thank them all very much for the privilege of being part of them. I think the fellows might like to say thank you by putting my hands together, wouldn't they? Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ian Battermore. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much. Sue, one of the most re rewarding aspects of your work, I'm sure, is that many of the people that you help are very young with a whole lifetime ahead of them. All I was doing was looking for golf balls. That's 12-year-old Mark Bellick of Bondi, oh, yeah. and with him, helicopter crewman Steve Dalby. <laughs> Steve, it was your very first day as crewman. Will you tell us what happened? Yeah, that's right. Um, in June 1978, we were up at our standby base at Long Reef when we intercepted a call from the police that a young boy had fallen off the cliff. We decided that we could go down and help, so we proceeded down there, and once we arrived, we found that it was the bottom of the cliff. Alan Edwards, a pilot, flew us to the bottom, where Sue and myself jumped out and climbed around the rocks to um, Mark. Sue there treated him. We put him in a stake slitter, and we were hauled back up to the top of the cliff. Well, Mark, you appear to be completely recovered. What would you like to say to Dr. Sue? Well, first, I'd like to say hello, Sue. Hi. And I've always wanted to meet you in person, and thank you for saving my life. Thank you, Mark Weddick. Mark. <laughs> and also thank you, Steve Dalton. To the love of travel that brought you to Australia after your graduation from London University, took you as a flying doctor to Kenya and on medical mission work to South Africa, India and the Middle East. As the crow flies, we met 50 miles from Yugi. Yes, it's Father Alfred Beresford, who we've flown all the way from Yugi on the border of the trans guys South Africa, and here he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, believe it or not, Father, All Saints Mission and Hospital was, of course, in your parish, wasn't it? That's right. <laughs> Would you tell us something about your meeting with Sue? Yes. Sue is a very adventurous spirit. Uh, and, of course, she didn't know what she was coming to when she came out of the Trans Sky. But nevertheless, she got plenty of medical experience, which she would not have got at St Mary's Paddington, for example, the tribal women would come in with their sick babies tied to their backs, many of them suffering from kwashiorkor, which is a disease brought on through lack of protein and could be fatal. The men, the tribal men, would ride in on their horses, carrying a sick child on their saddle in front of them. She would see plenty of cases of tuberculosis and I think a few cases of leprosy. Now, of course, Dr. Sue was there early in 1972. When did you see Sue again, Father? In June 1972, I had my first trip to England. Sue met me at Heathrow Airport. That evening, she took my nephew and me <laughs> to a nightclub in Leicester Square, <laughs> where we danced till the early hours of the morning. She wasn't satisfied with that. We went to a late cinema. We finally got back to the hotel about five in the morning. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> Wonderful to see you again, Sue. Well, thank you, Father Beresford. Hear more about Dr. Sue Rowley in just a moment. Sue, by 1976, your honorary medical director of the helicopter service, and spearheaded the move to the Royal North Shore Hospital, making it Australia's first hospital-based helicopter rescue service. And ladies and gentlemen, how about a thank you to these fellows, dedicated men indeed, and also to Dr. Sue Rowley, whose work, of course, is all completely voluntary.
So you're an important person in the lives of many Australians, especially this one. Playing his own composition, your husband of just a few weeks, accountant and jazz pianist, Michael Lujic. <laughs> So it was uh, Michael who told us that Singing in the Rain was your favourite song. Now, Michael, how did a nice, quiet musician accountant like you get mixed up with an adventurous girl like Sue? Well, I met uh, Sue in 1977 at a New Year's Eve party. I was leaving to go to a jazz club and opened the front door and there was Sue. I looked at her and she looked at me and I thought, wow, she's not a bad looking sort. <laughs> and I asked her to come with me. Well, it was about three weeks uh, after that that she invited me down to Long Reef where the helicopter was based at that time. And it was then I realised that she was the young doctor I read about in the newspapers. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> this girl's crazy, what I got myself into. <laughs> but it was too late. Anyway, Sue, it, uh, you, there's a lot, of, a lot of nice things being said about you tonight. And I'd just like to say that you're the most kind and warm-hearted person I know. <laughs> well, as you can probably gather, <laughs> quite naturally, quite naturally, Sue and Michael marry in the helicopter above Sydney Harbour Bridge and they sign the register at the hospital chapel. Now, Sue, see if you can recognise this voice. I guess it's too late to give her away. He's here from Birmingham, your father, Bert Rowley. <laughs> How do you feel about your daughter doing all the things that we've seen her doing tonight? Well, very delighted, <laughs> obviously, and very, very proud. But uh, not really surprised, actually, uh, Roddy, because she was always a, an adventuresome girl, and she always liked a challenge. And uh, if there was any challenges going around, then she was on the spot to face them. But if I could tell one little story that uh, illustrates this, uh, <laughs> When Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, she was so thrilled about it that she put shorts on immediately and I stood outside on the lawn with a stopwatch and she wouldn't stop training until she was convinced she'd beaten him in, in the four-minute mile. You know. <laughs> Obviously she hadn't, but um, she did emulate him in one thing. She, she did her training at St Mary's Hospital, uh, which is the same place that Roger Bannister did his. And I'm very, very proud of her. Bert, I'm sure the whole family is very proud of her. Sue, you came to Australia for a short holiday. Now you're married here. You've become a part of one of Australia's finest traditions, life-saving. Dr. Sue Rowley. This is your life. My next guest got married last Sunday morning, so I guess you'd expect them to be on a bit of a high, but uh, they're literally up in the air over their wedding because they got married in a helicopter. And I'd like you to welcome Sue Rowley and Mike Lusick. <laughs> well, welcome to both of you. Mr. and Mrs. Lusick, why did you get married in a helicopter, Sue? 
Well, the answer to that is really why not? Uh, because... Oh, okay. <laughs> well, one, you can't get the step outside for photographs. Although I can see a good reason for it. I mean, when the choir sang, Nearer my God to thee, they'd mean it, wouldn't they? <laughs> Actually, it's a natural progression. I'm deeply involved with two things uh, in Sydney. One, of course, is Michael, and the other is the Helicopter Rescue Service, for which I have the privilege of being the honorary medical director. That's the Wales. That's the Wales. The Wales Chopper, yeah. Service. Had you ever been in a chopper before, Mike? Yes, I was up there once before. It was November the 1st last year. How'd that happen? Well, they asked me to be a, a dummy patient. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, was on the... Uh, Opening day of the uh, first base, helicopter base yeah. at a hospital. Yeah. And uh, I just acted as a dummy patient and I was strapped up in a stretcher and wired up to various machinery. So I didn't get much of a chance to um, look out the views. No. And I, I suppose it was under those circumstances she said, marry me or else. <laughs> strapped up and moved. <laughs> <laughs> What's a way to catch a man, isn't it? We got some film uh, from the helicopter, which will sort of give people an idea of the sort of view they had while they're flying around being married. Now, wouldn't you agree that's better than looking at the four walls of the church? Hey? Eh? That's rather pretty, isn't it? Where did the ceremony begin? On the ground or uh, after you took off? Well, we got on at uh, North Shore Hospital mm -hmm. and uh, the pilot was my best man, and also at the front was the bridesmaid, Kerry McCormick. And at the back was uh, Reverend Ted Noss with Sue and I, and he was performing the, uh, the wedding ceremony. Did you sign the papers up in the air, Sue? No, we didn't actually. We came into London Royal North Shore and signed the papers in the chapel. Mm. We then took off from there and landed at Balmoral Beach, where I live. Mm. Uh, and then we took our wedding guests up to a local seafood restaurant for a champagne breakfast. Oh, that's the way to do it. <laughs> But what was it like uh, getting the photos taken? Yeah, I suppose you took them on the ground, did you, on the beach at Balmoral? Yes, we were very privileged. We didn't have to pay for photographers. <laughs> <laughs> How long has the helicopter been going with this sort of rescue work? Because it's quite incredible work you do. The Surf Life Saving Association has uh, backed the helicopter service now for seven years. Mm -hmm. But it's only been in the last two or three years that a supply and demand situation has occurred whereby we've been asked to do more and more medical work. Yes, like I, I believe kidney transplants are one of the things that uh, the helicopter's invaluable for. Yes, we have our own kidney transplant team and we'll fly out to peripheral hospitals and collect donor kidneys and bring them back to Sydney and transplant them into patients in the Sydney area so that they don't have to undergo dialysis. We also carry the emergency blood supply for Sydney uh, and are deeply involved at the moment with uh, the treatment and movement of spinal injury patients oh, yes, yeah. for John Yeo um, and also uh, newborn children for the Prince of Wales and the Children's Hospital. Uh, you uh, actually got involved when you were in America I believe uh, with the birth of a baby. You might tell people about that. Oh, well part of uh, Part of uh, my job is both looking forwards and backwards, and I believe that uh, as the only hospital-based helicopter rescue service in Australia, uh, we have a debt to help to teach other services in this country. And also looking forward, we need a yardstick to go somewhere forward, and therefore the obvious place to go is Europe and America. And I went over to America, and certainly in Denver, uh, was called upon well, late one night on a Saturday night to go up into the Colorado, into the Rocky Mountains, and uh, deliver a little boy up there. So you flew on out in the chopper, did you? Yes, I don't know who was more worried, the flight nurse who'd read all about it and had never done it before, and I had delivered many children, but many years before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God it was an easy birth, though, yes, it? We have some film here, too, which shows rather spectacular work that the chopper does. This is um, the Cliff Rescue.